good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to RSSL's third webinar in our sterile manufacturing series. This webinar is investigating sterility test failures. Before we start the webinar, I'd just like to go through some housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, please send us a short message in the question box on the right hand side of your screen. The team will then respond to you directly and try to resolve your issue. Please be aware though that we are working remotely, so sometimes there might be a slight delay. During the webinar, RSSL would like to invite you to ask questions, also using the question box on the right hand side. At the time, sorry, at the end of the webinar, time permitting, we will try to answer as many of these as possible. Any we don't get round to today, we will answer offline and share them with you all, along with the slides from today and a detailed white paper produced to supplement this webinar. For those of you uh, who attended either of our first two webinars back in April and May, welcome back. If you didn't attend, but you're interested to learn more about them, both are available to download on demand from RSSL's website. If you're tuning in for the first time, my name's Annette Russell, and I'm the sterile manufacturing lead here at RSSL. My role is to help facilitate our clients' requests supported by a team of experts in the field. If after the webinar you'd like to learn more about our offerings, please feel free to contact me direct either by email or the telephone number you can see on your screen now. So as we are finally starting to see the end to this COVID journey we've all been on, I've been reflecting on this year and the plans I made for 2020. I started the year ramping up my training with a view to run the Virgin London Marathon for the first time. And having completed a 20 mile run in training, this happened. Well, as you can imagine, that put paid to my training and I resorted to cake and beer. So I think I'm gonna to have to get those running shoes out soon before it's too late. RSSL also had big plans for 2020. We had planned to launch our new sterility suite and publicize this new venue um, venture at all the spring and autumn events around the country. Luckily, RSSL did manage to obtain our MHRA certification before the lockdown kicked in. Our teams here at RSSL have had to learn new ways of working with distancing and PPE, as I'm sure you're all having to get to grips with. But unlike my own plans, RSSL's new sterility suite is ramping up nicely. And we've even been able to support much needed sterile drugs for the fight against COVID. RSSL's team may not be seeing you at events around Europe at the moment, but we're looking forward to uh, different ways to meet with you and interact with you using things like this webinar. I'm proud to say that I work with a team of microbiology experts who support all our clients, both sterile and non-sterile, to the highest possible standard. RSSL are able to do this by offering endotoxin testing using the LAL method, we have our new sterility service that we launched earlier this year. We have got mycoplasma in the pipeline with fast mycoplasma testing due by the end of the year. We can support all your raw material testing, those routine vial and stopper testing. And our team of experts here at RSSL can also help with those more complex projects such as uh, cleaning validations, environmental monitoring, and investigative problems. We can even help set up reference databases for your fill finish lines that we can look back into. RSSL also has a training and consultancy group that can help support and advise on any of these topics and more. I'd now like to introduce you to our guest speaker, Dr. Tim Sandal. I'm sure many of you have heard of Tim and subscribed to his many publications. Tim has over 25 years of experience of microbiological research and biopharmaceutical processing. 
Tim is a member of several editorial boards and he has written over 600 book chapters, peer reviewed papers and technical articles relating to microbiology. Tim works for a pharmaceutical manufacturer in the UK and is a visiting tutor at both the, at both the University of Manchester and UCL. Over to you, Tim. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me uh, clearly um, and thank, welcome to the webinar. Um, so in this um, webinar, what we're going to be kind of looking at is what to do when we get a sterility test failure other than enter into a state of panic. Um, and to begin with, we're going to have a brief look at the sterility test, its application, its history and its weaknesses, because I think that helps to contextualise um, the amount of information we can sometimes get from the sterility test. Um, but then we're going to have a look at the immediate actions to take in the event of a failure and then how the investigation should move down to streams. So that would include laboratory failure investigations and process events as well. And it's important that um, if we have enough resources that we're following these two stream, streams simultaneously. And then we'll finish up with a look at some of the outcomes and follow up actions that can be taken. But just before um, launching into the, the core thing about sterility test failures, um, it's important to think about um, what is the sterility test. Now, there are different tests described as sterility tests, um, such as the release of culture meter, for example, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're going to look at the pharmacopoeia test for sterility. And the pharmacopoeia test is harmonized between the European pharmacopoeia, the United States pharmacopoeia, and the Japanese pharmacopoeia. And it's required for all aseptically filled products and for some terminally sterilized products where permission hasn't been granted for parametric release. And there are two methods, direct inoculation and membrane filtration. And as it stands that the membrane filtration method is far better. And that's because we can test a larger quantity of product. Um, so we're gaining a more accurate assessment of the status of the batch under test. It also stands that microorganisms can be more easily separated out for inhibitory substances. And most of the antimicrobial activity can be overcome by rinsing. And these latter two steps are kind of areas where we can aid the validation of the sterility test. However, some products will not filter. So that's the need for direct inoculation. And the uh, test uh, described in the pharmacopoeia is a culture based method. And it uses two culture media, uh, one to recover um, aerobic bacteria and fungi, and the other one to recover anaerobic and other types of aerobic bacteria. And after 14 days of incubation, the bottles are examined for visual turbidity. And the test is destructive um, because the container, once it's used and presented to the test, then it is um, gone for good. There are, of course, some uh, rapid microbiological methods um, which can give a, a more accurate indication of uh, contamination levels, but um, that doesn't really help with addressing the failure issue, which we're, we're focused on in a second. Um, but it's worth just reminding ourselves that the sterility test does have several flaws. It can only detect those microorganisms that can grow under conditions of the test. So this is limited by the type of culture media and its formulation, the length of time that the containers are incubated for, and the state of the microorganisms and their ability to grow over that period of time, and the incubation temperature. Plus, unless most of the batch is contaminated, 
that is a result of a gross failure, there is a greater chance of passing the test than failing it. And this can be illustrated statistically. And there's a, a, a several um, different uh, approaches to this, but generally, if 5% uh, of the batch was contaminated and that contamination was evenly distributed, and only 10 samples were selected for sterility testing, then it stands that just on the basis of sampling that 84 out of 100 times the test would pass, and only on 16 occasions would we stand a chance of detecting um, failures. And interestingly, this uh, statistical sampling weakness um, has been known for decades and there's a paper dating back to 1956 that describes the overall weaknesses of the sterility test. Now robustness can be increased by including batch specific events such as when close to when interventions are occurring however it still remains that um, it can be tricky to pick up uh, contamination. In addition there's also um, issues with um, recovering microbial challenges as from method validation, and overcoming the antimicrobial properties of the product, which can ideally be ironed out during validation, um, but sometimes when we're on the marginal uh, between passing and failing, that can present challenges, especially with varying formulations. Plus, uh, not, all, not all organisms found in the environment are culturable, and also some of them could at least theoretically pass through a 0.45 membrane filter. It also stands that some products due to their short expiry time, such as chemotherapy products, need to be used before the sterility test results are available. Therefore, as we mentioned in uh, earlier webinars in this series, that sterility assurance, uh, which is the overview of all aspects going into the process, including environmental controls, such as good human operations and supporting data from environmental monitoring, arguably provides more useful information than the sterility test itself. However, for aseptically filled products, we're mandated to do the sterility test and for most terminally sterilized products also. So failures can happen. And the first point is that ideally, there should be an SOP in place about how to conduct a microbiological contamination investigation or even ideally a special SOP or at least a set of uh, investigation areas for a sterility testing failure. And this is important because such investigations will be very different from general OOS investigations, which might be more geared towards, say, chemistry laboratory. So, and there may be some things in this presentation if you don't have such an SOP or you wish to benchmark your SOP against that you can use. Second point is you need to assemble an investigation team, including representatives of microbiology, production, quality assurance and engineering, and perhaps others. And the third point is that it's good practice because of the criticality of the sterility test failure and the interactions that will arise with regulators, that you fully document everything and ideally get it independently reviewed just in case of a of a sense check to say, you know, is there anything missing? Have we done this right? Often when you're too heavily involved with something, you don't, can't always stand back and look at it objectively. Okay, so the Trinity test has been announced and there are some immediate actions that should be taken. So first off, the product batch should be considered to be non-sterile and quarantined. The filling line upon which the problematic batch was processed should be shut down. And other products on the line, if it's a line used for different types of product, must also be considered at risk until the failed batch can be linked to a batch specific issue. And then later on, a documented decision will be required if that line is to be used for other products while the investigation is continuing. A decision is also required about other lines if you're in a multi-line facility. And here you need to pose the question to be able to answer it. And that is, is the sterility test failure based around something specific relating to a certain product or line? Or has there been a more concerning breakdown with the sterility assurance system? 
And any decision that you take in light of that, so let's say you do say it's good to go on other lines, may need to be re-examined as the investigation proceeds. So once the product is quarantined and the filling line or lines are suspended, then you need to start to investigate. And here it's important to give equal weight to the sterility test and the testing environment and the manufacturing and filling process. And it's important not to have any preconceived assumptions. So even if the operator comes running in and says, um, the, the glove had a large hole in it, you still need to go down the product route, otherwise you will face regulatory criticism because that could be mere coincidence. But the first thing to kick off with is to find out what the contaminant is. So the microbiology laboratory or contracted out facility needs to identify the contaminating organism or organisms. And here it's best to use a genotypic method because you're able to do comparisons with any environmental monitoring results of concern further down the line. And knowing the organism might give an indication as to the points of origin. So for example, if you are recovering a skin bacterium like a staphylococcus or a micrococcus, then you're know, signaling a potential for personnel activity. Again, a coriniform may also signal human activity, whereas the recovery of bacillus may suggest an environmental issue, such as something relating to equipment transfer or problem with air filtration. And a gram-negative bacterium, depending on the species, might suggest a possible water-related issue. So there's some key clues we can get from um, the identification result. OK, so what we're going to do now is focus on the aspects relating to the laboratory side of the investigation and then proceed to the production side. So the first thing in relation to the laboratory investigation is that the negative control for the sterility test needs to be assessed. So negative controls are carried out at the same time as the product test and they enable an assessment of the, of the media type and the ba same batch of media test kits used in the course of membrane filtration and also the way that things are transferred into the area, the isolator or uh, UDAF environment and also the way that the um, items are being handled. If the negative control recorded growth then this may well indicate a problem with the test environment or the technique of the operator and any contaminating organisms from the negative control should be compared to the failed sterility test ideally using a genotypic identification method, such as 16S RNA analysis that can be conducted with an instrument like a RIBA printer. And if the organisms match, then a case could be made for later on when all our avenues have been exhausted for cross-contamination. The second area to look at with the laboratory side of the investigation is with environmental monitoring in general. And this will be conducted during the sterility test and there'll also be environmental monitoring in relation to batch processing. And here we need to have had samples that can adequately assess air surface and operator contamination risks. Mm. And examining environmental monitoring data could help to make a connection between the contaminated microorganism in the sterility test, either pointing towards the sterility test environment or the operator, or it might direct us down the manufacturing route, which we look at later. It's also important the assessment looks at trends rather than just the samples associated with the particular session, because a prior build-up might indicate control breakdown. Also for the sterility test, data should be considered for the test room, as well as the actual grade A testing environment. And also it's useful at this point to look at disinfection and cleaning records to make sure that the area was cleaned and disinfected to schedule and adequately. Third, we need to assess if the sterility test media was suitable or not. And there's a number of things to consider here, such as the method of preparation, whether that was conducted in-house or externally, the growth promotion results, so ideally the batch would have been tested, sterilization records for the media, the storage conditions, the integrity of the containers, 
and whether any customer complaints have had to be raised, such as media arriving uh, where the outer containers become damaged and water's got in, or where caps are loose or cracks in bottles. Um, so this may also may give clues about why a failure may have happened. Fourth area to weigh up is the test complexity. And this is part of the check on potential operator error. And here we want to have a look at the relative difficulty of the sterility test procedure, because it does stand that testing some products is more difficult than others. So for example, a freeze dry product that requires reconstitution or a small volume product that requires bulking up requires more manipulations. So although methodological issues should be rare, and difficulties should ideally have been overcome during the method validation stage, issues can still arise. And also there may have been an, another operational problem causing text, test complexity that's only been flagged up in relation to this particular batch. The fifth area is with the test history. And this also might provide some information of use. Well, here we want to have a look at the frequency of sterility testing failures although these should be rare events, and also the instances of problematic tests. So again, problems with methodology, where tests have had to be abandoned and so on. And here we want to overlay that, to look for any patterns relating to certain operators, test environment, what other tests and activities were taking place around that time. So sometimes additional, what you might refer to as metadata, is important. So also the sixth area important to interview the operator and to ask, have they been trained? And then to follow up that asking, have they actually been trained on the particular product type? Or was it a generic sterility test training or was it on a product by product basis? And it comes back to the issue of some products being more complicated than others. We also want to verify whether the operator has been associated with any adverse environmental monitoring trends. And has the operator been involved with a sterility test failure before? And the answers to these types of questions might indicate whether personnel related errors were possible, for instance. The seventh area, we want to undertake an overview of the testing environment and consider physical test data, such as pressure differentials between the isolator room or the sterility testing room and the outside area. And there we have an isolator between the isolator itself and the room. Again, with isolators leak rates, we want to review the aseptic transfer method of getting materials into the room and then into the grade A testing environment. And then when we are using isolators to review the sanitization cycle, checking off things like the quality of the chemical agent, the concentration of the chemical agent. So if we're using hydrogen peroxide, that will have a particular required concentration, normally 30% weight by volume. The gassing time, particularly the dwell time, so the dwell time is the length of time that the gas at the right concentration is theoretically making contact with all of the items. We also need to look at load configurations as well. Uh, is this the validated load of the isolator or have we packed in extra items, for example? And although an isolator will be more robust than a unidirectional airflow device within a clean room, isolators can go wrong in adequate sanitization, risks from leak, leaks and particularly issues around glove integrity. And there's also other aspects with, with the method that uh, can cause problems. So often with membrane filtration, there'd be uh, tubing from chambers running into some kind of waste collection bag. One thing that can occur is suck back or flow back from that where we can get contamination build up. So that there are other aspects to consider in relation to the um, investigation. So with the laboratory side of things, it does stand that sterility test failures are rare. And if laboratory failures have happened before, you cannot immediately consider laboratory failures happening again. So again, one thing regulators do get very concerned with is preconceived investigations or what they refer to as SATNAV investigations. In terms of outcomes at this point, if everything within the laboratory is in control, then you need to carry on in earnest with the production side of the investigation. 
However, if laboratory error is suspected, then you still need to continue with the production error investigation until you reach the natural conclusion of that in order to rule out any coincidences. So with the production side, which you have got enough resources is ideally running in parallel, this should be based on a line of inquiry that asks, was there something different about the manufacturer of the failed product that differs from other batches? And one way to start with this is to review manufacturing batch records. And it's a good idea to have the failed batch and batches that have previously been assessed as satisfactory for the same product side by side and start to forensically look for any differences. It's also very important to talk to people, talk to manufacturing staff and try and find out things that might not be recorded within batch records in particular. You also need to consider as you're working through the investigation whether you can answer some key points. So for, our, for instance, are we dealing with a low number of contaminated vials and something quite event specific? And are the low numbers a single event or a series of similar events occurring through a process? And that might be more of a pertinent question for the filling process. Or conversely, are we dealing with a gross failure and many contaminated vials? And we may or may not know answers to this question. Now, oddly, having said that membrane filtration is, is the superior method, we can actually sometimes get more information for the types of investigations from direct inoculation because we have individual bottles tested um, in relation to separate media bottles. But it's still a key question and this may well point to the point of origin in the sterility test failure investigation. Okay, so some things we need to look at. We need to assess incoming raw materials and ask ourselves whether the materials received were satisfactory in terms of the container integrity, whether the materials pass the microbial enumeration test, along with any tests for specified pathogens. So ensuring that the materials were properly released. And here it's also useful to consider, even if the levels obtained are below the action level, if we normally don't see anything from testing the raw material, and so we normally get zero CFU per gram and the action level is 100, but on this occasion we're getting 20, 30, it still points towards something slightly different. So it's just trying to capture anything out of the ordinary, putting it to one side and then deep diving it later. Second area is with the core process. So here we need to examine the manufacturing process for unusual events. So again, reviewing side by side batch records is a good practice and checking for anomalies. Now, one of the big areas with microbiology where control can drift is time. So process time should run to a certain pattern. But if whole times need to be extended for any reason, then whole times give opportunities for microbial um, growth and hence proliferation. And particularly if we're not taking by burden samples after the whole extended hold time points, um, then there might be areas where we're not having sufficient data. So we need to check stages that could result in contamination. So we want to look deeply at sterilization records for errors. Wet equipment is a big concern. Um, and also the possibility of equipment that has been cleaned becoming recontaminated. Let's say that cleaned equipment is part adjacent to um, dirty equipment, for example, um, whereas they should, ideally should be segregated uh, in terms of being in different areas. Third area we wish to look at is with intermediate process bio burning. And here we want to see if the microbial trend was increasing or decreasing through the process. Most situations it should be decreasing, but if it starts to increase, then we're putting more microbial load and greater risk of problems further towards the end of the process. And here we also want to check whether the microbial counts obtained were typical or atypical. Could buy a burden build up be one of the reasons for failure? And are there any organisms that we wish to identify that can also help with our overall assessment of the origins of the contamination. 
The fourth area is with the pre-sterilization bio burden that's a prerequisite for um, aseptically filled products. And with termly sterilized products, then it's the bio burden challenge to the termly sterilization device that we're interested in. Um, but for aseptically filled products, the most important in process sample is a sample of the bulk solution prior to final filtration. Uh, and that's ideally located as close to the point of use as possible. And with the bioburn and recovered, uh, for those of you in Europe, manufacturing in Europe, then the limit is 10 CFU per 100 mil. Normally, you'd expect to be recovering zero. So any counts uh, from this sample are of concern. It's also important to review the filter itself uh, to check the integrity testing of the filter pre and post use and look for any anomalies here as well. The uh, fifth area is to look at endotoxin results, particularly final product and in process. And sometimes high level of endotoxin values can be recorded where bio burden results indicate no contamination whatsoever because endotoxin is most greatly produced from um, cells undergoing lysis and hence death. Um, and sometimes high level endotoxin values can be recorded um, for in process samples and or for final products. An elevated endotoxin in conjunction with a cirrhotic test failure may indicate gross contamination during processing and can also be a potential pointer towards the origin of contamination, such as something being wet and hence the buildup of gram negative bacteria. The sixth area is with aseptic filling and the filling process itself. And this is probably the activity from which most sterility test failures arise. So here it's important to do a detailed review of all the interventions and manipulations, all the stoppages, anything that led to an increase in time. To look at any additional process steps, such as the number of times stoppers might need to be added, for instance. And here it's particularly important to cross refer everything to do with the fill of concern alongside the most recent media fill. Because if things have strayed out what we normally cover from aseptic process simulations, then um, that is again cause of concern. We also want to assess clean room parameters as well, to look for anything unusual. So things like airflow velocity readings within the grade A area, pressure differentials, um, particularly between rooms, for example. So these can also give clues as to problems that might arise through the process. We also need to consider um, any changes that might have impacted upon processing. So here it's useful to look at any recent maintenance works, particularly leading up to the fill of concern and how what these involved and how they were covered and what the process impact assessment was. And one area of general concern is opening up panels within rooms and the level of cleaning and disinfection that takes place following such activities. We also need to check for any alterations to filling machines such as changes to doors, changes to guarding, alterations to belts, new dispensing needles, differences with stopper bowls, change out of HEPA filters and so on. And a number of those would ideally trigger an airflow visualization pattern to be conducted. And then if such a pattern was conducted, how does that compare to previous works? Where there are modifications made, how were they captured through change control. And I remember one AMHRA inspector telling me that there's no such thing as a like for like change when it comes to aseptic processing. And also it's worth considering whether any of the changes required a degree of operator retraining as well. And also with maintenance work, particularly if there's been a, a more longer shutdown, then there may be some issues associated with that. And then whether mm. there whether there was or wasn't a restart media field for example. It's also useful to um, examine clean room classification data. We we'll also take a general view on results or shifts in trend relating to 
room environment, changing rooms, corridors for both variables and uh, particle counts. We also have a look at any uh, utility maintenance records to go and see the QA team and to run through all the recent change controls. And covering things like operational changes, alterations to building design, different workflows if staff are now doing things in different order, if um, operational excellence have been up and uh, changed the schedules around, for instance. And also if there's been things like um, new shift patterns introduced, it might be that um, staff working on the aseptic processing line are suffering with, with more fatigue, for example, as they're adjusting to going towards a 24-7 working pattern, for example. Coming back to environmental monitoring data, um, so in terms of the um, batch feel, I want to keep a close eye on batch specific events and longer term trends again, because we are looking for possible signs of gradual deterioration. And we want to especially consider things like personnel finger plates and exit suit gown plates. And it's important, it is resource hungry, but it is an important exercise to compare all species recovered in relation to distributed test contaminants and ideally conduct genotypic analysis. Um, now, if the microorganisms detected in the sterility test are rarely found in the laboratory environment, then obviously this nudges us to think that product contamination is more likely than laboratory error. However, if the microorganism is found in both the laboratory and the production environment, then just based on that identification result, we cannot indicate at this stage whether it's due to product contamination or laboratory error, unless we have some other piece of information that gives us the answer to that question. It's also useful to review um, any observations that were made in relation to the particular filling run. So it might be that there was an observational window and perhaps a microbiologist or QA person was observing, or perhaps the facility was fitted with um, video recording, such as a CCTV system. Um, and that's obviously a laborious activity. Um, but it can be a useful one and it becomes increasingly laborious with the more cameras there are because all the hours of the operation need to be um, watched. It's also good practice to interview the operators and ask particularly, did anything happen that wasn't recorded in the batch record? Now, you may say everything should be recorded in the batch record, but often there are little subtleties that are not, or there might be cases of where things are said, well, the SOP says this way, but we've found our own way to do it better. So it's just asking those kind of questions. You also find out if any trainees were involved, and if they were, what was the degree of supervision? To assess whether operators were, were tired, as I said earlier about to give out shift changes, or were they asked to stay on and work extra overtime. To look carefully at the cleaning and disinfection records and weigh up the effectiveness of the cleaning techniques. And here again, um, watching past footage can help. Now, are people disinfecting with parallel strokes or were they uh, trying to disinfect as if they would be cleaning a window in their house or something? And also check for expiry times of things like detergents and disinfectants, particularly on the day of the product bill. And then going back to this point about um, media simulation trials, uh, there is a lot of useful information that can be gathered from analysing uh, the product fill against the media simulation trial, because the media simulation trial should be the worst case. It will have the maximum number of interventions. It will have the maximum number of operators. Um, it will be the longest time with the most challenging formulation. So there are things happening that are not directly captured in the media field, where one, it gives a, a pointer to making media field more robust going forwards, but it also might be an indicator that we're doing all that with the media field and the media field is successful and has been repeatedly successful. And the things that are different, then may well be the areas that you want to pursue in particular lines of inquiry. 
Um, and if there's been any media fuel failures, then it's worth dusting those down and looking at why they failed and seeing if there's any potential for commonality of root causes between the media fuel failure and the most recent sterility test failure. And it's particularly useful to look at the interventions taken from the sterility batch failure and to assess whether they were undertaken in the most re recent media fill. If not, then it might be the type of intervention that has introduced a new risk factor into the mix. So it's that kind of level of, of difference that, that's really important to focus on. Okay, so then we kind of reach a point when we're looking at the outcomes. So we've done our laboratory side investigation and we've done our process side investigation. And to me, there are three possible outcomes. The first one is that the sterility test failure was a process specific event. So let's say it was a open door intervention, not practiced in the media field of concern. So here the batch is rejected. The status of other batches needs to be considered, including those that have been previously released to make sure that the failure mode could not have impacted on those batches. And a risk review is needed before any further processing can begin. The second potential outcome is that the sterility test failure was due to laboratory and here, proving this needs to be done at the genotypic level. So we must have found something else somewhere that's an organism that matches in relation to the sterility test facility and closed out the production investigation. The third outcome is that the investigation is inconclusive, which is something that can occur with microbiology. And here, the investigation must err towards batch, batch rejection because are not certain and patient safety is paramount. And with these three potential outcomes, everything needs to be documented. And just to note that if you do go down the laboratory error path and you can feel very confident that is what it is, then you can um, undertake a retest, which is permitted under the pharmacopoeia. But this can only be when the investigation has been concluded and signed off by the quality assurance department and with the repeat sterility test based on the fda cfr 61012 guidance only one repeat sterility test can ever be conducted and even if this sterility test this second one was to fail and you can again point towards laboratory error but that can be the same issue you cannot do another sterility test and you have to reject the batch and that is the regulatory guidance with that. And then finally, it's important to make sure there are follow-up actions. Um, so you do need a risk assessment in relation to the process issues identified and then adequately reduce those risks going forward. You need to do an impact assessment for all the products, processes and filling areas. You need to set up appropriate preventative actions and then measure those after a period of time carrying out an efficacy review. You will probably need to retrain some operators and in most cases you need to run a media fill and um, the revision to EUG GMP Annex 1 um, is indicating now um, three media fills are required. The laboratory failures, we need to understand the control breakdown. And again, there might be things that need to change in terms of training, uh, greater robustness over isolated sanitization cycles, improvements to the disinfection practices for transferring items into the room, for example, and reframing staff. So in summary, um, what we've looked at is uh, we began by looking at the application of the sterility test and its general weaknesses. We spoke about things to do immediately when a failure occurs, which is to quarantine batches and suspend lines and then to get the organism identified. And then we followed two strands of investigation, one going down the laboratory route, looking for signs and evidence of laboratory error, and the other one going down the process route, looking for reasons why the production process may have led to a batch that is non-sterile. Then we went through the three scenarios for um, 
potential failures. And we looked at some of the types of preventative actions that can be taken. So thank you for your um, attention for the core part of the webinar and uh, can pass you back over to Annette for Q&A. Hello, Tim. Thank, thank you um, for that really comprehensive insight into investigating um, sterility test failures. We've had quite a few questions come in, um, so I'd like to ask a few of them in the time we've got remaining. I had a question from Abhishek. Can the laboratory investigation and product investigation start together, or do you need to complete phase one investigation first? Um. I would carry them out both at the same time. Um, now, I know some OOS guidance that um, do the laboratory part first, but it's all about time and history because it, it, it might be 14 days later that you found that you've got a sterility test failure. Let's say it's a slow growing or you, you forgot to check the containers or whatever. The longer you leave things of going into the production area and talking to operators, the harder it is for people to recall and to recollect things. So if you've got enough resource, if you've got enough microbiologists and QA and production staff the team, then I would suggest doing them both in parallel is, is a good practice. Uh, okay, thank you, Tim. Um, so you mentioned genotypic testing um, and David's asked what methods you would recommend. Um, that, yeah, I mean, there's two common types of Typic um, methods. There's uh, micro sequencing, um, and then there is ribotyping. In this case, I'm more towards um, ribotyping. The ribotyping um, looks at a portion of the um, bacterial genome that's highly conserved, and this is the 16s rRNA region. And here, it's possible to Brain match different organisms. So you can almost conclusively say that um, the organ found in location A might be linked to the gloved hand of operator B, for example. So it's quite a powerful tool for that purpose. Um, it's obviously slightly different for fungi. Um, so the genotypic methods for fungi often look at um, the, the ITS, which is the interscribed. Um, uh, spacer regions. But in essence, what you really want to be doing is a genotypic tool that can give you almost identical matching. And you certainly need that in order to justify any repeat test. Excellent. Um, so I have a question from Madupa. What is the value of endotoxin data and how can it help to get to the root cause? Um, Endotoxin data um, will, so if you're going to get an endotoxin failure, it's rare, it's rare really to be anything to do with the what went through the filling side, and, and, unless something has gone wrong. Uh, so an endotoxin um, more likely to occur in the process leading up to creating the bulk product. So that will, first of all, give you a clue um, where in the process the contamination might have come. It will also give you a clue as to the type of bacteria that might cause the contamination because um, you're leaning towards um, gram-negative bacteria. And then if you have gram-negative bacteria, unless you've had a major hygiene breakdown with people, then much more likely, given the numbers you need in order to trigger the endotoxin, come from water. So uh, it's helping direct you into looking for water leaks or uh, wet equipment or part of a process that might be stagnant water in a piece of pipework or a problem with a filtration unit or a problem with the CIP or if you have a manual cleaning or washing process. So it does give you an indication of the direction you may want to take uh, for the investigation. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another one here from Paul. What are the common sources of contamination in a, the pharmaceutical facility? 
Um, so there's been different um, studies um, looking at contamination um, sources, um, and generally um, around 70% of the hits are deemed to be the contamination arising from people, either due to their shedding from their skin or what they're doing, or also where they say poor mask um, control, for example. Um, second to that, it's evenly split between um, items going into clean rooms, whether it's been weaknesses with transfer um, disinfection or number of layers on items going in, and then with um, water uh, and water sources. And water is, is tricky because it's um, not only a vector of contamination, um, as with so is someone shedding into the air, for example, but water for a range of organisms is also a uh, growth source as well. So having areas that are wet that shouldn't be wet for prolonged periods of time can, can lead to quite high levels of um, contamination. So, yeah, I think that's a good point of like looking at some of the um, sources of contamination can also help direct the path of the investigation, which all comes down to um, the microbial identification. So the point I was saying at the beginning of the presentation is that not knowing the organism you're dealing with can be a really useful starting point for the investigation itself. Okay, um, I have one from Carolyn. For rapid microbiology methods, where it is difficult to recover microorganisms and there is no validated microorganism recovery process, how would you go about performing an investigation? Um, yes, because that then becomes quite um, challenging. So th there are different types of rapid methods. Um, and some do allow the recovery of the organism and some instead um, only give you um, indication of a biocontamination event. That becomes far more problematic. And in that case, I'd suggest that it becomes almost impossible to um, rule out laboratory error unless there was a really um, big failure, so let's say complete failure to sanitise an isolator or, or a massive hole in a glove, you might be able to argue that with, with a regulator, but it, but it does limit the amount of information um, that you have available. And that's one of the um, pros and cons of, 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 the, rapid, um, of the rapid method. So um, yeah, all I can say is that um, it is limited. OK, so uh, my last question that we've got time for is, is it necessary to check pre-sterilisation by a burden if the product is terminally sterilised at 121 degrees for 15 minutes? And that was from Vipin. Um, I believe it's good practice to um, do so because you want to verify that the challenge does not exceed what you have validated and, that, and that's going to be in relation to the any to your coldest spot in, in, in the process, but also in terms of the organism resistance as well. Um, so, you know, I've, I've come across an incident when um, uh, a terminally sterilised process was qualified and it was using a resistant organism, but uh, left open, things weren't cleaned properly, uh, the facility next to a farm, um, and the thermophilic actinomycete got in at and caused problems. So in my mind, it is still good practice to do that assessment, but I know not all facilities do so, but um, I'm kind of built some braces on that. Thank you. That, that's a good piece of advice there. Belt and braces is always good. Um, so thank you for everybody for attending the webinar. I hope you found it useful and we appreciate all the questions you've asked. As I said at the beginning, we haven't been able to answer all those questions, but we will send out a copy of them and the answers to everybody that's attended, along with a copy of the slides and the white, a link to the white paper. Um, we This was supposed to be the last um, webinar in our spring sterility series but we have decided that as COVID is still going on and it's a good opportunity for people to, to sit down and and sit on the webinars we're going to hold one more before the summer's 
upon us. So we hope to hold one in July and we thought we would open it out to the attendees to see if there's any specific to topics you'd like to hear about. So you can either drop them in the question box now before you leave or if you want to email me, my email address is on the screen now and we will pick up with Tim and we will issue out a um, to you all when we send out the um, webinar and the questions, we'll let you know the time and date and the title of that webinar coming in July. So on behalf of RSSL and the sterile manufacturing team, I'd like to thank you all for listening today and thank Tim for his excellent series that he's given us so far. Please do not hesitate to contact me if you've got any questions or if you need any support with any projects. And we look forward to having you all on the fourth surprise webinar in July. Good afternoon.